Good morning. You can join me in opening your Bibles to the letter of 1 Timothy. And if you don't have a Bible with you, please grab one uh, from under a seat nearby. And this is on page 991 in those Bibles around the room. And let's pray before we begin. Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we honor you and worship you and want to express now in this moment our sheer dependence on you for not only life, but spiritual life and renewal. So we pray that we would get our wisdom from your wisdom and from your word this morning. So we pray that you would open our minds and hearts by the Spirit to understand uh, rightly and to openly receive and to treasure your word, and in First Timothy, your vision for life as a local church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we usually take uh, one or two Sundays this time of year to uh, refresh our vision as a local church. So the church is central in God's purposes for His people and for the world and the eternal future of this world. Jesus came to give His life for the church. He calls the church his bride, and he is pouring out his spirit into the world to create more Christians and bring them together into these gatherings we call churches. But what is a church supposed to be like? What should the priorities of a local church be? Does it matter what we do when we gather like this on Sunday morning? Does it matter who leads it? What kind of people lead it? How they lead it? lead it. What should the tone and feel of our relationships together be like? Does it matter? Different churches give different answers to these questions. I've met church planters that are winging it with these questions. They do what they like or what they've seen someone else do. Other churches have a clear plan, but it's sheerly pragmatic. They structure the church based on a business model. The metrics that matter most are numbers and budget. Others fell in love with a certain church tradition. They do what they do because they like what they've done. Other churches may have a mix of members that have different ideas of what the church should be like and should be doing. Our church certainly has a diversity of opinions and preferences in various matters. But what are we supposed to be like as a church? Well, what if God has given us direction on these matters? What if the God who created the idea of the church has an opinion about what the church should be like and should be doing. It answers the questions that we're raising here. What if he gave us a blueprint? Well, he did. It's all across the New Testament, and it's especially focused on in what we call the pastoral letters, like First and Second Timothy and Titus. So these letters show us how God's Word shapes God's people. So this morning, we're going to overview First Timothy. And then next Sunday, we'll overview the letter of Titus, and we'll hit the high points to discover the key priorities of a healthy church. And the heart of 1 Timothy is in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Paul gives a bit of a purpose statement for why he's writing at least much of this letter. So Paul had planted a church in Ephesus, this city. Now a younger pastor, Timothy, is continuing to lead the church and organize it. And Paul plans to return to this town, but he wrote to give Timothy instructions in the meantime. So right in the middle of the letter in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says this. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So when someone becomes a Christian, when you trust in Jesus, receive the forgiveness of your sins, are restored into a relationship with God, He also brings you into a new household, and that's the local church. So Paul wrote this letter to explain how to live as this new household. So 1 Timothy gives us a blueprint for a healthy church. It gives us an overarching vision for the priorities of a local church. So Paul unfolds this in five sections which show us five priorities. Now, these priorities that we'll see here are not the only priorities of a healthy church, but they are non-negotiable. 
So if you're looking to be a part of a healthy church, if the Lord has you move and you're looking for another church, if you're looking for a church right now to consider your home church, these should be non-negotiable priorities because they're given to us in God's own Word. So a healthy church is called to guard the gospel, gather with prayer, appoint leaders with character, encourage and honor one another, and pursue contentment and generosity. So let's walk through these priorities together. So first, guard the gospel. So the gospel is the message about the story of Jesus. It's His perfect life, His death in our place, substitutionary death, and then His victorious resurrection and conquering sin and Satan and death, and His exaltation as King over all things, and His coming return. That's the story of Jesus, and He does this on behalf of sinners, inviting us to repent of our sins, to trust in Him, receiving the forgiveness of sins, and then following Him. So as people hear the message of Jesus, God opens their hearts to receive that message, and they come to faith. So this is how the gospel creates Christians, and the gospel brings us together as a church. There's no gospel, there's no church. There is a church because there is a gospel, this message. But what happens if a church starts to drift from or shift away from, or minimize, or distort this message. Well, this happens to many churches and denominations and movements within a broader umbrella of what's, what people would use the word Christianity to refer to. Some have long abandoned the gospel, or they've moved beyond it to care about things that become more important to them, or they've shifted with the cultural winds, and they've slowly drifted from the real Jesus, So how big of a deal is that? Does it really matter what a church believes? Is it okay as long as a church says they like the Bible and says they worship Jesus and call themselves a Christian church? Well, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy to address that very issue. The church where Timothy served had teachers who were shifting away from the truth, and Paul wrote Timothy to lead the church to guard the gospel. That's the emphasis of the first chapter. So certain people were teaching false doctrine, and they were obsessing about genealogies and promoting speculations. So this is verses 3 and 4. You can read this with me. It says, and as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And then Paul gives the reason for this charge for Timothy to address those people. In verse 5, he says, the aim of our charge, so the goal of this charge to correct these people is love. And it's a love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. So he says, we're to hold fast to the gospel with a pure heart and faith for the sake of love. The gospel message promotes real faith, trust in Jesus, and love for God and one another. False teaching promotes speculation. So Timothy needs to shut that false teaching down. So what happens if you change or drift from the purity of the gospel message? Well, you lose the freedom and joy that we see Paul express down in verses 12 and 14, 12 through 14. Listen to Paul's, not just his words, but also what we can perceive to be his tone, the freedom, the joy that's coming out of him because he's holding fast to this gospel and commending this. Verse 12, I thank him who's given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And then listen to this, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And then verse 15 is a summary of this gospel message that Timothy is to guard, that every church is to guard. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. And here it is, that Christ Jesus came into the world 
to save sinners. So Paul is urging this pastoral leader to help that local church hold fast to this message. And if you want to see what happens when you leave the gospel, he tells us at the end of the chapter, he mentions a couple guys by name who he says have shipwrecked their faith. So what does it mean for us to hold fast to the gospel, to guard the gospel today? Well, it means the message of Jesus from 2,000 years ago is still the message for today. It's the, it was the message for Paul, whom he says was a, a Jewish leader who persecuted Christians at first. It was a message for these pagan people in Ephesus who then came to faith through this message. It's been the message that spread around Europe and then entered Asia and Africa and Australia and South America and North America. And in every church, in every culture, in every century, this is the message to keep and to guard. So this means doctrine matters, theology matters, and especially the truths related to what Paul says in verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you know how much faithful doctrine is packed into that little sentence? It teaches us who humanity is. We're all sinners. So that assumes the story of how God created us, made us in His image to flourish with goodness and love, but we rejected Him and we're now sinners. It teaches us who Jesus is. He's the Christ, Christ Jesus, which is Messiah Jesus, the King Jesus who came into the world. So His incarnation, becoming a human being, truly God, truly man for us and our salvation. This teaches us, therefore, about God's love that He sent Jesus to come into the world to rescue and save us. It teaches us about salvation because that's accomplished through Jesus and His grace for sinners. We could go on. But sadly, there are thousands of churches having services this very moment who have not guarded the gospel message. They've redefined what sin is, or they've reinterpreted who Jesus was, or they've minimized our need for salvation, or they believe these things, but they've made something else the main thing, and they've slowly drifted from the gospel. And to recognize that isn't to put any other church or our church on some kind of pedestal or posture above anyone. It's just a recognition that as humble sinners, we receive the truth and we want to keep the truth and keep that the main thing. This can happen to any church, including ours, the drift from the gospel. So Don Carson describes how this happened to a group of churches. Um, He was talking to a leader in that movement. Um, It was the Mennonite leader who he was talking to, and that leader summarized his movement and what he saw like this. One generation cherished the gospel and believed that the entailment of the gospel lay in certain social and political commitments. That's great. The next generation assumed the gospel and emphasized the social and political commitments. So there was a, still a believing in the gospel, but no longer a cherishing it or making it the main thing, but assuming it. We all know this, right? I mean, it's the gospel. Let's get on with the things that we're really excited about now. And then the leader said this, the present generation identifies itself with the social and political commitments. While the gospel is variously confessed or disowned, it no longer lies at the heart of the belief system. So we could be the generation that starts down the path of abandoning the gospel in the story of Zionsville Fellowship. And we would do it not necessarily by outright rejecting it, but by subtly displacing it from our affections and the center of our life together. So this is why we celebrate the gospel on Sundays. This is why we encourage one another to know doctrine and read good theology. This is why we have a statement of faith. This is why we clarify the gospel in our membership course. For those exploring Christianity, maybe you're not yet convinced that Jesus is the Savior or this gospel's true. Just want you to know that one of the reasons why we guard the gospel in the ways that I'm talking about here is for your sake, because we love you, and because we want you to know this true message that can set you free and restore you to God. We want to guard the gospel. So, second, we gather with prayer. So, in chapter two, Paul focuses on how prayer should be a key part of our gathering. He commends all kinds of prayer for all kinds of people. 
You can read the beginning with me. He says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So why emphasize the prayer for government leaders here? Well, so that, he says, we Christians can lead a peaceful and quiet life. Now, that may at first sound like a self-focused kind of prayer, but the purpose is for the sake of the gospel spreading. He explains this next in verses 3 and 4. He says, this is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So here's what seems to be the flow of his thought here. Pray for government leaders so that they can live and lead in such a way that allows Christians under their rule to live peaceful and quiet lives so that as those Christians live those lives, those Christians also will be sharing the gospel with people and living lives of good works, good works and other people can come to know the Lord. So the assumption is that when Christians live peaceful lives, they're sharing the gospel, and so we pray for government leaders to create the peaceful conditions, you know, without persecution against Christians, but the peaceful conditions so that the gospel can spread and Christians can bless the world with good works and sharing the message of Jesus. Paul then gives specific directions to men and women here. He wants men to stop arguing about speculative theology and instead to pray verse 8. He says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So men should be more focused on prayer than obscure debates. Paul then addresses a couple concerns with the women in Ephesus. The first is with the way that they were dressing. So wealthy women in Ephesus would dress in a way that sometimes flaunted wealth or were seductive. It was a sexualized culture like ours. And Paul calls Christian women to a different standard. He calls them to dress modestly and to emphasize the beauty of a life of good works. This is verses 9 and 10. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. The second issue has become... uh, significantly controversial today. Some women in the church seem to be usurping authority and spreading false doctrine that was going on there. And Paul addresses this in verses 11 and 12. He says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, there's various views on how to understand this, and I hope to teach through First Timothy at some point, and we can spend more time on these things, I'll also put a resource in the midweek this week, but a few notes here. Um, one way to interpret this that many take today is that Paul is only addressing a very specific situation in Ephesus, and that this is not a general command for all his churches of all time. The other main view is that this is a general command that does apply to us today, and this is what we believe as a church. Paul is referring to authoritative teaching in the context of the church's corporate gathering here, and he says that's reserved for qualified men, and then he roots this rationale for this in the creation account of Adam and Eve. So can't go into detail about it today, but I want to be clear about a couple things. We believe that men and women are made in God's image. We believe that men and women have equal value and dignity. We honor women and we encourage them to use their gifts and their skills in the life of the local church. And that includes the gifts of leadership and Bible teaching. And we also believe that men benefit from the wisdom and the insight of women. But you may also notice that we only have qualified men preach on Sundays in our gathering and serve as elders. So you may wonder why we do that. This text is a primary reason. We're convinced that this reserves teaching in the corporate gathering to qualified men. And then the next chapter refers to elders as being for qualified men. Again, there's more to say, but this is an overview. So the second priority of a healthy church is that we gather together with unity and with prayer. 
We want to be a church that keeps prayer central in our gathering. So this is why we encourage you to pray on your way here on Sundays. We pray as part of our welcome at the beginning of the service. Most of our songs are actually prayers directed to God, though sometimes also singing to one another. A man or a woman leads us then in extended prayer in the middle of the service. We pray right before the sermon. We pray after the sermon. We encourage you to stick around and talk and encourage one another and pray as things come up after the service. Third, a healthy church appoints leaders with character. So in the third chapter, Paul focuses on two leadership groups, elders and deacons, or what he refers to as, here as overseers and deacons. So this first group are elders. They're called overseers because they oversee the church. They're the primary leaders of the local church. The very first quality he mentions is probably heading for the rest. They're to be above reproach. So what does that mean? To be above reproach means you live in such a way that no accusation against your character can stick. And the rest of the characteristics flow from this. So notice verse 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, and so forth. We live in a culture that values competency and charisma over character. But what do you notice about this list? They are mainly character qualities. In God's church, character is more important than what we refer to as charisma. Character is more prominent than competencies here. But Paul does mention two skills. Elders must be able to teach, and they must manage their households well. So to be able to teach means you're able to help the church guard the gospel which is what we saw already. You're able to teach sound doctrine, defend sound doctrine. The elders are to be the theological leaders of the local church. And the second skill is managing one's household, which is the skill of leadership. The church is the household of God. So if you're going to manage the household of God, you have to be able to manage your own family well if you have a family. The second category Uh, for leadership is the group of deacons. The deacon means servant, so this is a group that serves the church. Deacons serve under and alongside the elders. They they often focus more on practical matters, and the emphasis of the qualifications here are also on character. The list is in verses 8 to 13. You can scan it here, and with this group, uh, we believe also that it's for both men and women, so unlike the elders. And so we have a group of deacons who are men and women in the church, and they lead acts of service with faithfulness, with wisdom, with humility. They often do far more than we know or see. So I like to say, see a deacon, thank a deacon. Chapter 4 continues the theme of godly leadership. Paul's especially focusing on the role of Timothy as a pastoral leader. He calls him to be able to train himself to detect false teaching and to commend the truth. He focuses on how Timothy is to be a man who immerses himself in the Scriptures who devotes himself to reading it publicly and then teaching it and exhorting from it. And he focuses especially on guarding his character and immersing himself in the Bible for teaching. Chapter 4 and verse 16 summarizes the call to him. So this is for any man pursuing pastoral leadership. So maybe you are thinking the Lord might have you be in pastoral ministry or be a church planter or be an elder. It says this, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. So a healthy church is to appoint leaders with character. Uh, Fourth priority, encourage and honor one another. This is chapter 5. We live in a world that's filled with discouragement. We live in a culture where people often dishonor one another. We put each other down to prop ourselves up. All of us are wired to do this. But the local church is to be a bright place of encouragement and honor. And everyone can spread this culture among us. And pastoral leaders are to be the pace setters in this. So Paul tells Timothy, as a pastoral leader, to set the pace for this in verses 1 to 2. He says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. 
younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. So Timothy is to treat church members as a family and to spread a culture of encouragement. And then the rest of this chapter, and a bit into chapter 6, focuses on showing honor to specific roles. So first he calls us to honor widows in verses 3 to 16. So when a woman in that culture lost her husband, she also lost her financial stability. So the church is called to honor and support them. And there's a process here for enrolling widows into this realm of support. But notice in verse 3 that he says to honor widows who are truly widows. He explains then next that some widows are not actually in need of the support of the church. Some women are taking advantage of the church's support. Apparently, some younger women were enrolling and then being just gossips and spreading false teaching around. Others were being supported, but they had close family members who should have been supporting them. Right? The priority is for someone's family to support them. But then Paul says that if a woman is truly alone, if she's devoting her life to good works and she's godly, and if she doesn't have a family to support her, then honor her, enroll her in this support system. So we have a process in our church that we call an in-reach for this kind of purpose. When a member falls into financial hardship, we want to help, and it usually involves uh, relational and meet- relationship meetings with an elder and a deacon to discern how to best care for the person. Paul next calls the church to honor elders. Verse 17 says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So Paul refers to elders who rule well, and then he refers to those elders who labor in preaching and in teaching. So all elders are to lead and be able to teach, but some elders can give extra time to this. They labor in this, and they lead particularly well, and they give their time to the work of preaching and teaching. So what does it mean when he says that these elders are deserving of double honor? Well, most commentators uh, seem to agree that this means they deserve both honor and an honorarium. In other words, this is about both esteem and compensation. And so he goes on in verse 18 to say, a laborer deserves his wages. So this is why we have some elders who are also part of our supported staff. And they're supported by you so that they can focus their time and energy to lead and teach. So I'm grateful for this. It is a huge gift for me to have my vocation, um, being able to give myself to leading and laboring and preaching and teaching. Paul also gives guidance for how to handle a situation when an elder is in sin. So this isn't kind of just a blanket honoring of elders just because they're elders. An elder can fall into sin as well. And then he also tells Timothy not to rush the process of appointing elders. This is almost certainly what he means in verse 22 when he says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. This moment of laying on hands to appoint someone to eldership, he's saying, don't rush this. This is a sacred responsibility, and the men have to be of character. So we are intentionally slow and careful with appointing elders. The final call to honor is with the relationship of a bond servant and a master. Paul deals with how servants can honor a master. Now, Paul does not commend servanthood or slavery here at all. In fact, he often gives principles that uh, are, lead ultimately to its undoing, but here he gives encouragement for how to endure it as a Christian. So the church is to cultivate a, a culture of encouragement and honor. It's the kind of culture the gospel creates. We come together and we look around this room and we greet each other in the lobby and around the building and we see each other as men and women who are made in God's image, who are loved by God, who are redeemed by Jesus, who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We see people who were, were brought together as a, into a new family with. And so this is a life-giving and refreshing culture we're to create in the midst of the discouragements of life. So let's enjoy this and cultivate it on all the more. I believe we have this as a church and we don't want to lose it. The fifth priority and last one is to pursue contentment with generosity. This is the last chapter 
A common thread running through this chapter is contentment. Notice verses 6 through 8. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. What a radical vision for life. He's saying if you have clothes and you have food, then you should not also have discontentment in your life. You have your necessities. The Lord has blessed you. There is zero room for griping, whining, complaining, looking around, woe is me, I don't have the things that everyone else has. Zero place for it. Then he warns about, therefore, the opposite of contentment and the danger of greed and discontentment. He goes on to say, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And then in verse 17, he calls the rich to pursue contentment. He doesn't rebuke the rich. Wealth is a gift from God. Okay, so what do we do with it? If we're okay not having it because we can be content without it, what do we do if the Lord gives it? Well, verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, and that's many of us in this room, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. And here's a kind of richness to be rich in, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of that which is truly life. So the Lord has entrusted many of us in this room with wealth in this season or in a coming season. Some of you may not be wealthy, but many of you are. Some of you who are wealthy don't actually feel wealthy and you don't think of yourself as wealthy because you live in an area where so many people are more wealthy than you or because you lack contentment. And so you're focusing on the things you don't have or the things you wish you had or the things that other people have. And so this text calls you to recognize that you are wealthy. You have wealth. So give thanks for it and then have a posture of readiness to give. And there are so many people in this room that I'm looking at that do such a good job with this. And so if you feel that you struggle with this, look around because there are people in this room who are outdoing others in doing this and you can learn from them and become like them. So the point here is to focus less on being rich with great wealth and focus more on being rich with generous good works. So this is Paul's vision for the local church. These are some of the key priorities for churches. So if you want to know what our vision is for Zionsville Fellowship, this is a large part of it. Again, these are not all the priorities we should have, but these are non-negotiables. So if you're looking for a church, look for these priorities in that church. There's a historic principle that we embrace as a church, and it's the Reformation principle of reformed and always being reformed according to the Word of God. So I want to wrap up here by reflecting on that principle a bit in light of this book. So we are reformed according to God's Word. So we recognize, though, that we can always improve. We can always be more faithful to God's Word. So this is why, as leaders, we don't take the view of our church family here um, we don't take the view that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because the church is not a matter of being broken or fixed. It's a matter of being reformed and therefore then always being reformed according to God's word. So it's about being increasingly faithful. So as elders regularly assess our church and ministries and how we can improve or how we can adapt given the, the unique gifts that we have with our members, or our cultural context, or the size of our church, or the needs for the present day, or our own church family, we recognize that some things may need to change over time. So, for example, just over a year ago, we reformed our membership process. It wasn't broken per se, but we saw that it could improve, especially in light of some changes in our church. And so we moved from an informal membership process to one that's formal while still maintaining a relational heart. 
The church is a household, and so it's important that we are familial, but also households know who the members of households are. We also recently reformed the way deacons operate. They used to operate as a large team and made most of their decisions together, um, and that worked really well, but there were some challenges and inefficiencies over time with that, and so the deacons are now organized uh, in a way that includes uh, sub-teams. So we have a finance team, a building use team, safety and security team, and so forth. You can see them on our website. Uh, we've also improved how our staff is organized. We've clarified roles, created a process for care and accountability and development. We've improved the way elders care for members and one another. So two of our monthly meetings are devoted to, in large part, to checking in with and then praying for various members of the church family. And we check in on one elder each time we do this as well. And so we have several questions that we ask of one another, like how are you doing emotionally and physically and spiritually? What have you been reading in God's Word and how has your prayer life been? Are there any struggles or temptations we should know about? This allows us to take those qualifications in chapter 3 and make them functional and, and take them seriously. We're regularly working with ministry leaders to help improve ministries as well. So we could go on, but all of this is because of the principle that we are reformed and always being reformed according to the Word of God. So this is the vision for local church. So let's guard the gospel. Let's not get bored with the gospel. Let's not let the gospel get fuzzy in our minds. Let's learn good theology. Let's never lose sight of God's love, mercy, and grace in Jesus. Let's gather with prayer. When we come together on Sundays, we come to engage with God, to hear His Word, and then respond with prayer. We pray for all people, especially that they might come to know Jesus. Let's appoint leaders with character. We don't want to value competency, competency and charisma over character. We want men and women who know Christ and are becoming like Him. Let's enjoy this gospel culture of encouragement and honor. And let's pursue contentment and generosity. The Lord has entrusted so many of us with more wealth than most people in human history have ever had. So let's give to the local church for our ministries and mission. Let's give to those in need. And let's live with generosity. And now let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your mercy to us that has come and your grace has overflowed to us with the faith and love that are in Jesus. We thank you for this trustworthy saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us. And so we pray that you would help us as a church family to guard the gospel. Pray that you would help us gather with prayer. We pray that you would make us a congregation with the pursuit of holiness and character at the forefront, especially with leaders as pace setters. We pray that we would have a culture where we encourage one another and welcome one another as we've been welcomed by Jesus and honor one another. And we pray that you would give us contentment and gratefulness and generosity. In Jesus' name, amen.